Welcome to the video on total joint replacements. My name is Leanne. I'm the orthopedic navigator at Northwestern Orthopedics. I work with all of you and your upcoming joint replacements. Throughout this video, you will learn what to expect on the day of surgery, how to take care of yourself after your joint replacement, some equipment that we will be using along the way. Please take notes of any questions that you may have. I may be contacted in the office at 524 8935. My number is also in your total joint replacement binder along with the majority of the information that you will see in this video. I'd like to thank you for choosing Northwestern Medical Center and Northwestern Orthopedics for your surgical needs. It is required that you have a history and physical to be done with your primary medical doctor for clearance for surgery. This history and physical must be done within 30 days prior to your surgery date. Two weeks before surgery, you will receive a phone call from a nurse in our surgical services department. During that phone call, they will review general questions and special directions, medical history, your medication list, and when you should stop eating, drinking, and certain medications that you should be stopping. Three business days prior to surgery, is when you will receive a phone call from surgical services with the time of arrival for your day of surgery. There are certain medications that you are required to stop before surgery. Most of these medications need to be stopped two weeks before surgery unless instructed otherwise. Medications to stop include aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, some examples are Aleve, Advil, Ibuprofen, and Mobic. Also, some supplements we would like you to stop prior to surgery, such as fish oil. Anesthesia also may have additional medications that they require you to stop prior to surgery. The surgical service team will make sure that you are aware of those medications. Those medications will also be written on your list that you receive in the mail with all of your surgery information. Please feel free to call the office if you have any questions about certain medications. Cleaning your body before surgery. If you are having your hip or your knee replaced, we ask that you do not shave the operative leg for five days before surgery. When you come into the hospital to do your preoperative lab work, you will be given three scrub brushes. One will be for the morning of surgery, one for the day prior, and one for the day before that. So for example, if your surgery is on Monday, we would like you to take a shower using this scrub brush Monday morning before surgery, Sunday, and Saturday. To start, we'd like you to wash your hair and body like you normally do with regular soap and shampoo, and wet the scrub brush, and then turn the water off. Wash gently from the neck down for about five minutes. Pay special attention to the area where you will be having surgery. Avoid contact with eyes, ears, and genitals. And then turn the water back on and rinse all of the soap off your entire body. We would like you to pack some items to bring in with you when you come into the hospital. Loose clothing for each day. If you are having your hip or your knee replaced, jogging pants, sweatpants, pajama pants, shorts, something that is loose and easy to pull up and down. If you are having your shoulder replaced, large oversized t-shirts or button-up shirts, some supportive walking shoes as you will be walking in the hallways as well as your room. Please make sure that you alert us to any changes in medications when you come in the morning of surgery. You can leave all your medications at home as we will use our medications in our pharmacy. But if you do have inhalers or eye drops that you like to use at home, you are welcome to bring those in. If you use a CPAP or a BiPAP machine at night to sleep with, please bring that to the hospital with you and also your patient total joint guidebook. On the day of surgery, when you arrive to the hospital, you will go directly to surgical services for registration. Please bring an insurance card and your photo ID. A staff member will place an ID bracelet on your wrist. 
This bracelet will contain your birthday and your name. Before any staff member in the hospital does anything with you, they will always be asking you your name and your birthday. This is a safety measure to ensure that we are doing the right thing for the right person. Before surgery, you will be escorted to a private room. At this point, your family may be asked to wait in the waiting room, but they will be invited back to sit with you prior to your surgery. A nurse will help you get ready for surgery by helping you into a hospital gown, taking your blood pressure, checking your heart rate and your temperature. They will be asking you a series of questions and will be starting an IV and giving you some IV fluids. You will also be given some medications that will help with pain and swelling after the surgery. And you will have the opportunity to meet with our anesthesiologist and with your surgeon for any questions before surgery. You then will be brought into our operating room. It does tend to be a little colder in our operating room, but we do have several warm blankets to help keep you comfortable. We will be placing stickers on your chest to monitor your heart during the surgery. You will also have a blood pressure cuff on your arm and an oxygen monitor on your finger. Depending on the type of anesthesia you have, you may have some oxygen tubing placed in your nostrils or an oxygen mask on your face. When your surgery is complete, we will then be moving you to our post-anesthesia care unit. This is where we will start waking you up after surgery. You will frequently have your blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen levels checked. A nurse will be monitoring your pain level and any nausea. At this point, the surgeon will meet with your family and update them on how surgery went. If your family is unable to stay in the hospital, please leave a phone number where they can be reached. Also, you will be having x-rays taken after your surgery. Once you're alert, awake, and your pain is at a tolerable level, you will be transferred to your private room on our progressive care unit. You'll be transferred by bed to the progressive care unit. We will bring your family with you. A nurse will be in to review your past medical history and to review some questions with you and your family. Nursing staff will be in often for the first several hours to check on your blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen, asking you about your pain level, asking about any numbness or tingling you may be experiencing, and looking at your surgical incision, at your dressing, and looking for any swelling. Pain control is very important after having a total joint replacement. If you are able to keep your pain levels low, you will be able to get more rest, get in and out of bed more comfortably, and be able to do your exercises more easily. Here in the hospital, we use a pain scale of zero to 10. Zero meaning no pain at all, and 10 meaning the worst pain you've ever experienced. A pain score of zero immediately after surgery is not a reasonable goal. What we do ask everybody to think about is what is an acceptable score for you after surgery? Most people feel that level is between a two or a three. You will have pain medications ordered for you by your doctor around the clock to help decrease pain and swelling at your surgical site. It is recommended to take this medication as ordered by your doctor. It is best if you ask for any additional pain medication when your pain level starts to rise. Do not allow your pain to get severe. When our pain levels are very, very high, an 8, 9, or 10, it takes a lot more medication and time to be able to get it down to a comfortable level. If you maintain good pain control, it takes less pain medication and less time to manage your pain overall. Please refer to the discharge instructions that are in the back of your blue total joint binder for more information on medications to help with pain control. Relaxation and diversion are also helpful in decreasing pain. You may bring personal items with you to help with this, such as bringing electronic devices, being able to listen to music, reading. After surgery, when you are settled in your room, 
A staff member will bring you an incentive spirometer. An incentive spirometer is used to help prevent pneumonia after surgery. It helps to open up the lungs and encourages coughing and deep breathing. A staff member will show you how to use this. To start, you will take a normal breath. Place the mouth around the mouthpiece and inhale slowly and deeply, exhaling normally. We do ask that you use this incentive spirometer 10 times an hour while you are awake. If you're a television watcher, every time a commercial comes on, it's handy to grab this incentive spirometer and use it. You'll be using this in the hospital as well as at home. We do recommend using it at home, especially for the first couple of weeks while you're not up moving around as much as you normally would. After surgery, while in the hospital, you will have a pair of our vena flows on your lower legs. These are to help prevent blood clots after surgery. It is recommended that you wear these vena flows on your lower legs at all times while not walking, whether you're lying in bed or you're sitting in your recliner chair with your legs elevated. It's very important to have these on. Your doctor orders cold therapy, or ice, to be applied over your dressing to help decrease bleeding, swelling, and pain. The cryocuff is used after total knee replacement surgery, non-stop for the first 72 hours, and then as needed for increased pain and or swelling. You will be given the cryocuff, you will be given the cryocuff to use for icing and home. Keep the jug even with your cuff, too low will burn out the pump, and too high will overfill it. Cryocuff IC Patient Instruction Video This device can be cold enough to cause serious injury. Do not use this device if you cannot check your skin conditions frequently. Be sure to read and understand all instructions before use. Additional warnings may be found in the instructions for use. This is a non-sterile prescription device for single patient use only. Be sure to speak with your doctor regarding your cold therapy needs. Warning. Read and understand all warnings and instructions for use before using this device. Additional warnings appear in the instructions for use. Do not use this device without a prescription from your physician. Your prescription must state how long to apply your cold treatment, how long your break should be, and the length of your treatment time. If you have any questions about your treatment plan, be sure to ask your prescribing physician. Do not use this device if a prescription has not been provided for you or you do not understand your prescription. Sensitivity and susceptibility to cold vary for each person, so remember to frequently check your skin conditions. If you experience increased pain, burning, numbness, tingling, increased redness, discoloration, itching, burning, increased swelling, irritation, or other changes in skin condition under the cold pad and around the treatment area, immediately discontinue use and contact your physician. Be sure to let your physician know if the following conditions apply to you. Raynaud's disease, arthritic conditions, peripheral vascular disease, children under 12, decreased skin sensitivity, poor circulation, compromised local circulation, hypercoagulation disorder, diabetes, or neuropathies. Getting started. Prep the cooler before applying the cuff. 1. Attach the blue hose to the cooler. 2. Fill the cooler with water to the line located inside the cooler. 3. Then fill with ice. 4. Apply the insulation disc on top. 5. Securely attach the lid. The lid should be snug. 6. You can shake the cooler. 7. Allow ice and water to sit for 5 minutes to chill. Always apply the cuff empty. Use only aircast cryocuffs with the aircast cryocuff IC unit. Read all instructions supplied with the specific cryocuff before applying. Knee application. One, make sure that your cuff is empty prior to application. Two, place the cuff on the front of the knee and secure the top strap. Top strap should be snug, but not tight. Three, adjust the front opening. Your kneecap should appear through the opening. Four, Apply the bottom strap loosely. To fill your cuff, attach the blue tube to your cryocuff. 
listen for a click to ensure proper connection. Two, lift the cooler 12 to 15 inches above your cup. This will take approximately 45 seconds. Three, place the cooler on a stable surface so that the base of the cooler is equal to the cryo cup to ensure optimal performance. Four, then simply plug in the power supply to turn on the unit. You will hear the motor turning on and off about every 30 seconds. This will provide you with intermittent compression, which you will feel during the on cycle. While the unit is running, remember to never lift the cooler higher than four inches above the cup as this can cause excessive pressure. Reduce pressure in the cup if you experience any discomfort, numbness, or tingling. To do so, simply lower the cooler below the cup. Warning, please remember to consider the following. One, do not use an elastic banded wrap with the cryo cup. Two, dressings under the cryo cuff should be applied lightly. Three, once the cryo cuff is filled, cooler should be level with the cup. Four, reduce pressure if needed. Five, always empty the cuff after each use. To empty the cuff, one, unplug the power supply from the unit. Two, lower the cooler below the cuff. This could take approximately 45 seconds. Three, Disconnect cuff from blue tube. Troubleshooting. If your pad is not getting cold, make sure there is no water left in the unit or cuff from a previous use. Empty cuff after each use and only apply an empty cuff to the body. Check for kinks in the hose. Make sure to fill the cuff prior to plugging the unit in. Make sure the unit has ice and water filled to the appropriate lines Check the connections and listen for a click when connecting the hose to the cuff. Make sure the unit and the cuff are set level for optimal performance. If the motor is not turning on, check the power connection. Increase separation between equipment. Plug the power supply into an outlet on a circuit different than other devices. If the motor is not functioning, it can be used as a gravity fed device. You will likely leave the hospital using a walker. However, occasionally people are ready to use a cane if their strength and balance allow. While in the hospital, your physical therapist can help you adjust your cane or walker to the correct height. If you already have a cane or walker at home, you will need to make sure that it is at the correct height for you. To measure the correct height for a walker, you will need to place the walker right in front of you. Stand up as straight as you can with your arms resting at your side. The handle of the walker should be at the height of your wrist. This will allow you to keep a slight bend in your elbows when you are walking with your walker. To measure the correct height for your cane, make sure you are standing up as straight as you can with your arms resting at your side. The top of the cane should be in line with your wrist. It is likely you will be allowed to put full weight on your surgical leg after surgery. However, depending on your surgery, you may be asked to limit the amount of weight you put on your surgical leg. If this happens, your physical therapist in the hospital can help you understand your weight-bearing restrictions and can teach you how to move about while still maintaining these restrictions. To walk with a walker, you first move the walker at a comfortable distance in front of you. Next, move your surgical leg towards the walker, then take a step with your non-surgical leg. Make sure to hold your head up and look straight ahead. When using a walker to back up to a chair, you will first start by moving your non-surgical leg back towards the chair, followed by your surgical leg, and then finally the walker. Never let the walker get too far ahead of you. When using a cane, you will hold the cane in the hand on the opposite side of your surgical leg. So, if your surgery was on your left leg, you would hold the cane in your right hand. To begin walking with a cane, you first move the cane forward, then step your surgical leg forward in line with the cane, and then take a step with your non-surgical leg. 
As you get comfortable with this, you'll be able to move your cane and your surgical leg at the same time. This will allow you to walk in a more fluid pattern. On the day of surgery, most patients are allowed to put full weight on the operated leg. You will be out of bed with assistance on the same day as your surgery. Either our physical therapy staff or our nursing staff will assist you with this. Some patients are able to stand at the side of the bed, and some patients are able to walk to the bathroom. Studies have shown patients that get out of bed on the day of surgery ultimately have a better and faster recovery. Everyone will start with using a walker and progress to a cane as long as balance allows. The morning after surgery, blood will be drawn. Your surgeon and or physician assistant will be around to see you while you are in the hospital. Most patients are able to go home the day after surgery. Some patients are even able to go home the evening of surgery. In order to be discharged home, you must be able to tolerate eating and drinking, going to the bathroom on your own, your pain level must be under control. You must be able to get in and out of bed safely and also demonstrate with our physical therapist how to do your home exercises and the ability to go up and down stairs. Before leaving the hospital, a nurse will review with you your discharge instructions. Also, the medications that you should be taking while at home and answer any questions you may have. If you do spend the night in the hospital, I myself will also be around to see you the day after surgery, after you've worked with your physical therapist, to ensure that our discharge plan that we have set before surgery is the right and safe plan for you. You will work with a physical therapist while at the hospital for exercises and increasing your mobility. The physical therapist will work with you on how to get in and out of bed safely, do stair training, education on how to get in and out of cars. They will make sure that you are familiar with your home exercise program and any precautions that you may have. We do have large recliner chairs in every room, and it is encouraged that you sit up in the chairs for all of your meals. Prior to this surgery, I have talked with you about our initial plans for physical therapy after surgery. The goal for the majority of our patients receiving a total joint surgery is for outpatient physical therapy. Home with outpatient physical therapy can lead to a quicker recovery and greater independence. Our therapists work closely with your orthopedic surgeon. Safety is our most important thing. If you do have difficulty getting in and out of the house, we will discuss the possibility of getting home health physical therapy in your home. If you are receiving your outpatient physical therapy at one of our Northwestern Medical Center sites, which include Cobblestone, Georgia, and Enosburg, you already have an appointment scheduled for you. If you are receiving physical therapy elsewhere, please call your physical therapy department and set up your outpatient physical therapy appointment. You should have your first appointment anywhere from four to five days after surgery. If you will be receiving home health services, a referral will be sent to the home health agency of your choice the day after your surgery. Home health will call you prior to arriving to set up a date and time for them to make their first visit. We recommend having someone stay with you or be available to you for the first week after surgery. We do work with you on being as independent as possible for at home. Having somebody with you is helpful for when it comes to meal times, helping switch out ice and ice packs, and somebody to help observe for any side effects that may come along with taking new medications. Having a place set up and ready for you when you get home is also a great idea. That place might be close to the bathroom, uh, have a table next to you 
where you can access all of your frequently used items, such as books, remotes, and drinks. Also, meals that are pre-made that just require reheating are very convenient ideas. If you are going to be spending the majority of your time at home, please make sure any dishes, pots, or pans are at a countertop level. That way, you are not needing to bend over to get into cupboards or to reach into cupboards that are high above your head. Please make sure that your home is set up for your safe return after surgery. Remove any scatter rugs that could cause tripping. It is recommended that you have railings on your stairways. Grab bars or non-skid mats in showers or tubs. Adequate lighting in rooms and hallways. We would like to prevent any tripping from dark hallways if you're up walking in the middle of the night. Beware of animals. Animals tend to be tripping hazards. Please refer to the home safety pages for more suggestions and your total joint replacement binders. Once you go home, it is encouraged that you get up every hour while awake to go for a short walk within your home. Bruising and swelling is to be expected after surgery. You may notice bruising or swelling at the surgical site, or down your leg on the surgical side, or down your arm on the surgical side. When resting, elevate your leg above the level of your heart to help reduce swelling. Icing, at the same time, will also help. If you're having a knee replacement, do not put a pillow under your knee. Make sure that the pillow is under your heel so that your leg remains straight when resting. Lifting your leg may be difficult after having a total knee or total hip replacement. We will work with you on different techniques that will help assist you to get your legs in and out of bed on your own. After surgery, you will have a dressing in place that will look similar to this. This dressing needs to stay in place for one full week. Your physical therapist will then change your dressing and replace with the same type of dressing. That will remain in place for one additional week. At the two week mark, this dressing will be removed completely. You may shower as soon as you feel comfortable enough for standing in the shower for that amount of time. We do ask if you shower that you cover this dressing up to help protect it from the water. Some people like to cover the dressing with plastic wrap or press and seal also is a good choice. We do recommend no swimming in pools, soaking in hot tubs or bathtubs for at least two weeks after surgery. It is important that your surgical incision skin is healed before you go into any large bodies of water. After your surgery, it is important to elevate your leg throughout the day to help decrease swelling. But remember, do not put the pillow under your knee. Instead, place the pillow under your heel so that your knee is able to stay as straight as possible when you are resting. When getting up from a chair, have your surgical leg out straight and use your non-surgical leg and hands on the armrest of the chair to push yourself into a standing position. When sitting down into a chair, put your surgical leg out ahead of your non-surgical leg. Then reach back for the armrest with your hands and use your arms while bending your non-surgical leg to lower yourself into the chair. When going upstairs after surgery, make sure to hold on to the handrails. Go up first with your non-surgical leg and then bring your surgical leg to the same step. Continue this pattern until you have finished climbing the stairs. To go down, you will do the opposite and bring your surgical leg down first and then bring your non-surgical leg to the same step. Doing it this way allows your non-surgical leg to always be doing the difficult work and having to do the bending. Some people remember this by saying, up with the good and down with the bad. One exercise is walking, and it is good to get up one time every waking hour and walk in your house to avoid stiffness and blood clots. 
When doing exercises, it is important not to hold your breath and to perform the exercises slowly and gently. You will do some exercises while lying down or reclined, some while sitting, and some while standing. The first exercise is ankle pumps. While lying down with your leg relaxed, gently bend and straighten the ankle through the full range of motion. To do this, you will first start by pulling your toes towards your nose. And then you will push your toes down like you're pressing on the gas pedal of a car. Repeat exercise 10 times every hour. The next exercise is quadricep sets. While lying down, tighten the muscle on the top of your thigh by pressing your knee down into the bed. Hold for 10 to 15 seconds and then relax and repeat two times. Repeat this exercise every time you lie down. The next exercise is knee flexion where you will try to bend your knee by sliding your heel towards your buttock. If needed, you can help your leg bend by holding your thigh with your hand. An alternative way to do this is to hold your thigh and relax your lower leg, letting gravity bend your knee for you. You will hold this for 10 seconds and repeat two to three times. The next exercise is called a straight leg raise. While lying on your back, you will tighten the muscle above your knee in order to fully straighten your knee. And then you will try to lift your leg up without letting your knee bend. You will try to hold this for five seconds and repeat it 10 times. The next exercise is knee flexion while sitting. First, sit in a firm chair and place your feet firmly on the floor. Lift your buttocks off the chair to slide forward until you feel a stretch in your thighs and knees. Hold for 15 to 30 seconds, then slide back. Repeat the exercise two times. Repeat this exercise every time you sit down. A rocking chair or glider may also help. Terminal knee extension. In standing, while holding on to something sturdy like a counter, you will perform the terminal knee extension, where you again try to tighten the muscle above your knee in order to push your knee into as straight a position as possible. You will hold this for 15 seconds and repeat two to three times. You want to try to perform your exercises three times per day. It is always a good idea to ice your knee and elevate after you do your exercises. Again, you may want to do these exercises prior to surgery to strengthen your knee as much as you can beforehand. After surgery, it is important that we prevent any blood clots from forming. When blood clots form, they form in the calves of our legs. The risk of this is that blood clot could then travel to your heart, your brain, or your lungs, causing death, heart attack, or strokes. Having a total joint replacement surgery increases your risk of having a blood clot. Also, not getting up and walking around as you normally do also puts you at a higher risk. We like to prevent blood clots, one, by having you take an aspirin after surgery once a day, if you normally take blood thinners, we will restart you on your regular blood thinners after surgery. Getting up and going for a short walk around your home will also help circulate the blood in your body. And also ankle pumps as demonstrated in the physical therapy PT video. One way that we like to prevent blood clots is using our home compression devices. Our home compression devices will be delivered to you while you're in the hospital after surgery. You have been prescribed a triple play VT home care kit to use after surgery because your physician has identified you as a high risk for DVT or deep vein thrombosis. Without proper preventative care, DVT can be the catalyst for several life-threatening complications. 
DVT is a blood clot that forms in one of the body's deep veins, usually in the lower leg. This clot, if not avoided, can travel to the lungs and trigger a pulmonary embolism. This can cause chest pain, severe breathing problems, and even death. Annually, DVT cases result in 300,000 deaths. That's more fatalities than breast cancer, AIDS, and highway accidents combined. Those at the highest risk for DVT are patients who are recovering from surgery. The triple play VT is a convenient and effective form of preventative care. The sleeves use alternating sequential compression on the lower legs to stimulate blood flow during periods of immobility, greatly reducing your risk for DVT. Unlike prescription medication, this mechanical compression is safe and effective therapy with no side effects. The lightweight triple play VT and calf sleeves are comfortable and easy to use at home after your surgery. The triple play VT comes with two calf sleeves. Wrap one sleeve around each calf with a hose in back and pointing down and secure with the Velcro tabs. The sleeve should fit snugly. Make sure the thumb tabs are depressed on the pump ports and connect each hose to the triple play VT into the ports marked leg one and leg two. Make sure they click into place. Press and hold the power on off button until the display reads on. This will automatically start both DVT ports. You will feel the compression begin alternating between legs. The pressure should be comfortable and not too tight. At the end of your prescribed treatment period, return the machine and power cord in the prepaid address mailer using the instructions in your kit. If your triple play VT unit will not turn on, the battery may not be fully charged. Connect the power adapter to the unit and plug into a wall supply for a fresh charge. You may use the unit while it's being charged. If you cannot feel pressure on the calves, the sleeve may not be wrapped tightly enough, the air tubes may not be fully connected, or the sleeves may be damaged. Ensure that the sleeves are connected and wrapped properly. If this issue is not resolved, call customer service at 800-994-0464 for replacement sleeves. If the pump shows a high pressure alarm, remove any kinks from the tubing and be sure they are not tangled or constricted. Turn the pump off and back on again. If the pump shows a low pressure alarm, ensure that the tubing is properly connected and the sleeves are wrapped tightly enough to fit two fingers between the wrap and the skin. Turn the unit off and then back on to try again. If a low alarm persists, call customer service. A BL alarm indicates the battery charge is low. Connect the charger to a wall supply to recharge. If the pump is no longer charging, contact customer service. Transitioning home after surgery should be a time of recovery, not risk. It is extremely important that you follow your physician's advice to help prevent this life-threatening condition. For questions about getting started with your DVT prevention therapy, talk to your healthcare provider or call 800-994-0464. The home compression devices are ordered by your surgeon to be worn after surgery. We would like you to wear these home compression devices on your lower legs for the first 30 days after surgery. We'd like you to be wearing them whenever you're not up walking around. That does include nighttime when you're sleeping. Included in the box that comes with the device is directions on how to use the device as well as information on how to prevent blood clots. After the 30 days, this device does need to be returned to the manufacturer. You may do that one of two ways. Everybody has a follow-up in the office around four weeks after surgery. You are welcome to bring the box and all of its contents into the orthopedic office, and I will make sure to mail it back to the manufacturer. You also are welcome to do that yourself. 
There are instructions on the inside cover on how to return the device. The manufacturer would only like the device box and the charger back. We do not return the wraps. There is a pre-stamped envelope that does come in all of the boxes as well. This device is treated just like a medication where it does require a prescription. We do bill your insurance company for the use of this device. When the device is brought to you while you're in the hospital, you will have a form to sign. Your signature on the form will represent that you received a box, that you understand that the box does need to be returned to the company after you are done using it. It also gives permission to send your insurance information and any medical information to this company as well. If your insurance does not cover this device, the company will charge you up to $145 rental fee for the month. If you have any questions or concerns, you are welcome to contact myself or the company. When you come into surgical services to do your pre-surgical blood work, you will be handed a questionnaire. The questionnaire is called the Global Health Form. This Global Health Form is similar to the questionnaires you receive in your doctor's office. What we would like you to do is go through and mark down how you feel your physical, mental, and emotional health is. Also, you will be given what we call an outcome form. This outcome form is a questionnaire that will be asking about your pain and how much your pain has been affecting your daily living. We would like you to make these scores based on what you have experienced for the last week. You will receive this paper as mentioned when you come in for your pre-surgical blood work. Also, you will receive this after your surgery whenever you come into the orthopedic office. The main point of having a joint replacement surgery is to help relieve your pain. These forms help us be able to track how much pain you had before surgery and how much relief you have had with the surgery. So hi there, I'm Katie Montang, one of the anesthesiologists, here to talk to you about the anesthesia side of things for your upcoming joint procedure. Um, we generally talk about the different types of anesthesia that you can have uh, for your joints, specifically hips and knees. Um, there are two different kinds. We have spinal anesthesia and general anesthesia. And most people are familiar with general anesthesia and comfortable with general anesthesia, which means that you will have a breathing tube in place. Uh, you won't be aware of it going in, you won't be aware of it coming out. Um, but typically the side effects that we talk about are um, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, um, just kind of feeling groggy. Um, but all in all, it's, you know, safer than driving your car here. Um, and in that sense, um, people generally have either had it or known somebody with it and are pretty comfortable with knowing what general anesthesia is. Um, the other type of anesthesia is spinal anesthesia, which for joint procedures such as uh, knees and hips, we will typically try to talk you into. Uh, the safety of having spinal anesthesia is uh, threefold. Um, one, there's uh, less chance of blood clots after surgery. There's less bleeding during the surgery. And then lastly, and probably our most favorite, is the pain control after the fact. So what happens during spinal anesthesia, you come into the OR, we give you a little medication to make you not care so much about what's happening around you. We wash your back off in an antiseptic solution, uh, numb your skin up, and then place the spinal medication right into the spinal fluid. That gets you numb from about the belly button down, and then we'll position you on the OR table and start sedation. So one of the questions I get the most is, if I have a spinal anesthetic, does that mean I have to be awake? No, you do not have to be awake. Um, you'll be sedated. Uh, you may hear what's happening in the OR, which sometimes people are like, oh no, I don't want to hear anything that's going on. So I won't guarantee that you won't hear, but I will guarantee that if you do hear something, you probably won't care about it. Um, and then we know to turn the sedation up a little bit more. The nice thing about the spinal is that um, that's keeping you nice and numb for the procedure. The sedation's keeping you relaxed and comfortable, but then once the bandages are going on, we can turn that sedation off and you're feeling like yourself and your kind of mind is much more clear than under general anesthesia. The risks of nausea vomiting are less with a spinal anesthetic. And like I said, um, 
the pain control. So once, once we wake you up and we're heading to the recovery area, even though you're awake and feeling, you know, much to yourself again, um, that spinal is still on board a little bit. So the numbing effect is, is still on board. As that spinal wears off gradually in the recovery room, you're able to tell your nurse that the pain is kind of eking back through and we can titrate pain medication in slowly instead of trying to play catch up, which sometimes we have to do under general anesthesia. The other nice thing is that our orthopedic surgeons use a medication called Expirel. So as they're closing, um, they'll put in some Expirel, which is a local anesthetic that um, emits over time. Uh, the manufacturer will tell you about 96 hours. We say, you know, from our experience, more like 72, so three days. So oftentimes you're actually home by the time that Expirel is wearing off. And sometimes people will be like, oh, I must have overdone it with physical therapy. Um, typically, it's probably that the Expirel is wearing off. Um, so yeah, so spinal anesthesia is not without risk either. We'll be poking your skin with something sharp anytime we do that. Uh, there's a risk of bleeding or infection. We're working near your nerves, so there's risk of nerve injury. It's like 1 in 50,000, so pretty slim but not zero. And anything we give you um, as anesthesia providers uh, tends to make your blood pressure and heart rate go down. Anything surgeons do to you tend to make your heart rate and blood pressure go up. Anytime there's that risk for fluctuation, there's a risk for heart attack or stroke. Our job is to keep you nice and steady, So, um, but th we have to tell you about the risks. So uh, those are very, very remote risks. And like I said, uh, generally, anesthesia that we're providing for you is safer than getting yourself to the hospital. So those are um, the things that we can provide and uh, that we work with our orthopedic surgeons to keep you safe and make the best anesthetic choice on the day of your surgery. But certainly any questions you have, you can um, tell your orthopedic surgeon to ask us and we can give you a call or you can ask us on the day of surgery.